prefer the ring of... Enigma Avenue. Who are you? Call me... The Riddler. The 2004 Batman cartoon was notable for how producer and character designer Jeff Matsuda created a Gotham City with the most striking depiction of Batman's rogues gallery that's ever graced the small screen. The villains stood out drastically in style compared to the familiar villains of Batman the Animated Series and the DC Animated Universe that dominated Batman media from 1992 to 2006. Some of the villains are barely recognizable to their traditional depictions of comics and cartoons, and fans of the winding down DCAU were not happy with this apparent usurper Batman show. Today, let's look at one of the villains from the Batman show that strayed far from his interpretation in the comics, Riddler. Bravo! Someone is very bright. Step into the light. So the Riddler can see you. You may be wondering why I'm referring to this incarnation as Riddler instead of THE Riddler. So one of the decisions of this TV series was to invert the naming scheme between Batman and his villains. Typically, Batman's villains have the article THE in front of their name, like the Joker, the Penguin, the Riddler, to give them a presence. If you translate Ra's al Ghul, you get the demon's head in English. Not all Batman villains get this treatment, it's a status thing. But in the Batman, if you couldn't tell by the title, the emphasis was given to Batman while his rogues gallery are typically referred to as Joker, Penguin, Riddler, and the like. But now you may be like, hey wait, you just showed us a clip of Riddler referring to himself as the Riddler. Yes, because like with most versions of the character, he's still a complete narcissist of course. In his introductory cold open, he's going to refer to himself with the to establish his own importance. Only he refers to himself as the Riddler, everyone else calls him Riddler. The Riddler is a character that has a long history of being one of Batman's most significant rogues. The villain first appeared in 1948 and became a staple Batman villain in the public eye with the 1960s Batman TV series. With Frank Gorshin playing the role of the Riddler in the pilot episode, leading to a series of performances that has captivated what everybody thinks of the Riddler as a character ever since. <laughs> You're scared. You're really scared that I'll outwit your Batman yet again, all right? <laughs> of course, this is the 60s TV show, so we're talking about a very campy version of the character. To give you an idea of how impactful the 60s villains were in comics, the campy villains Joker, Penguin, Catwoman, and Riddler were forbidden from being used in the comics during a time in the 1970s because the comics were going in a quote-unquote grittier direction, and didn't want to be associated with the campy show. But these performances of the big four Batman villains still resonate in pop culture today. Out of these 70s comics ultimately led to Batman the Animated Series along with the two Tim Burton movies of course, which turned into Batman Beyond, the rest of the DCAU, and Teen Titans, and eventually the Batman. Oh yeah, there's also a Jim Carrey performance of the Riddler on the big screen in 1995. That's Jim Carrey being Jim Carrey. But to be fair to Carrey, the blueprint for the Riddler villain was, and arguably still is, Frank Gorshin's interpretation, which is also a cackling maniac. So, you know, he did fit tight. After you've chewed over this one for a while, look for two more. Adios, amigos. See you in court. <laughs> Bruce Timm, Alan Burnett, Paul Dini, and the likes on BTAS distinguished between their Joker and their Riddler by having their Riddler be cerebral compared to their Joker being a clown. A very maniacal clown. I'd argue that it's important to have these characters differ in personality because they can kind of meld into the same type of villain because they are very similar. Riddler? You stealing my shtick? I do riddles. I don't tell jokes. Joker likes to announce his crimes in a game to get Batman to stop him, while Riddler leaves riddles for the detective to solve at the scene of the crime. It's not hard to have a Riddler be a Joker and a Joker be a Riddler, with the only differences being appearance. Though the two can have key differences that can make both of them function separately in Batman's rogues gallery. The Batman followed in the footsteps of B-Taz and decided to have a calm and collected Riddler to their own unique, zany version of Joker. Despite being one of the big four Batman villains, the ones in the Batman 60s TV film and the first four villains featured in the Burton Schumacher films, Riddler is the only one to not appear in the first season of the Batman. In his place, Mr. Freeze is elevated to fourth place of the Mount Rushmore of Batman villains. 
most likely due to Paul Dini's reimagined take on the character and not because of Arnold Schwarzenegger hamming it up in the critically panned Batman and Robin movie. I can only beg your forgiveness and pray you hear me somehow, some place, some place where a warm hand waits for mine. And honestly, it probably had to do with toys too. Because if you were a kid in winter 2004, would you want a Mr. Freeze action figure or would you want a Marilyn Manson action figure? Whatever the reason for not including Riddler in the first season of The Batman falls in the lap of head writer Dwayne Capizzi, who was responsible for guiding the show through its first four seasons. Riddler first appears in episode 15 of The Batman. To give you a comparison, Riddler's first appearance in BTAS is episode 40 which is still season 1 of BTAS because it was given a 65 one season order, which is something that will most likely never happen to a cartoon again because of the internet and streaming. In story terms, the reason Riddler did not appear in season 1 falls on largely what the writers wanted to do with the character. With this version of Batman, the writers wanted to focus on a younger Bruce Wayne, who had just completed his third year of crime fighting and had cleaned the streets of gangsters like Rupert Thorne, opening the door for a new type of criminal in Gotham City. The BTAS version had an experienced Batman that had been fighting crime for much longer, since before now college age Dick Grayson came to live in Wayne Manor. Even though according to the writer's bible for BTAS, every villain would get an introductory episode except for the three Burton movie villains. They did that because it's more exciting when Batman doesn't know what his rogues are capable of initially and most of the audience for the show wouldn't know most of Batman's rogues besides from the Burton movies. The Batman went for the same exciting theme, but also highlighted the inexperience of the Cape Crusader. Even though the Batman was an episodic show, there was a loose thread throughout each season like its contemporary Teen Titans. The first season was about Batman meeting the core of his rogues gallery, Alfred trying to get him to quit being the Batman, and Batman having issues with Gotham PD, where he has to manage his friendship with Detective Ethan Bennett, who doesn't know that he's the Batman. Oh yeah, and Ethan is also charged with bringing the Batman in. A Riddler story wasn't really necessary here with all that was going on. There is one episode of Season 1 called Q&A, which is the least important episode of Season 1 as it doesn't have anything to do with the overarching plot of the season, and the villain in the episode doesn't have a significant appearance ever again. The episode revolves around the villain Clue Master, who has been holding a grudge since childhood and is now ready to enact his revenge. Clue Master is very intelligent, obsessive compulsive, and narcissistic. Does that remind you of anyone? Oh yeah, and here's the alleged beta design for the Riddler. So, Q&A could have initially been a Riddler episode, but they changed it to Clue Master late in development because they ultimately decided that the Riddler design would be stupid for a recurring villain, particularly in a show based around action. Nobody's going to believe for more than 5 minutes that Cremel Mountain can bounce around. People were very skeptical of what Penguin could do in the early part of the series. You could even argue that the question Batman uses to stump Artie, who is the Batman, could have set up a whole arc in the show to deduce Batman's secret identity. But hey, that's just a theory. A Batman theory. Ah, the Batman. Your timely arrival proves that there's at least one intellect in Gotham City worthy of Clue Master. Give it up, Arthur. Artie Brown never surrenders! But in the spirit of gamesmanship, I shall give you, the Batman, one chance to save their cheating lives. A bonus round! I don't play games. But you will play, are they get acid washed? Bonus round! Stop Clue Master and they go free! Well, that doesn't seem fair. Is there anything the great Arthur Brown doesn't know? You'll find out! What can I ask you about? Anything! No topic is off limits? History, science, literature! Music, biology, current events? Anything! Let's go already! Okay. Name the true identity of... the Batman. <laughs> Trick question! Ask another! You said I could ask anything. No! Fair! Honestly, I'm skeptical of these beta designs being real besides the ones for Bruce Wayne and Joker. None of them really strike me as Matsuda's art style. That's why beta designs are beta designs, since if they were any good, then they would have probably been in the actual show. It's conceivable that the episode was originally a Riddler episode and was shifted to Clue Master, but what makes this unlikely is that the first three seasons of the show had very little turnaround based off the episode air dates, 
so it's possible that the first two seasons were produced at the same time. A last minute palette swap is pretty dubious. Conceivably, there was room to include Riddler in the first season, but they went a different route. Keep the bat busy. The artist must not be disturbed. The second season of The Batman revolves around teamwork and partnerships. Batman gains an unlikely ally in Detective Ellen Yin after the end of season one, where Joker drives Ethan Bennett mad and inadvertently turns him into the shape-shifting Clayface. You don't get it, do you? Joker didn't just melt my skin, he melted my mind! The second season is the one with the least amount of new villains introduced, with about four or five, depends on how you count it, appearing. Most of the episodes revolve around team-ups or conflicts between pairs of the ten villains introduced in season one, mirroring the new alliance between Yin and Batman. Of the new villains, Riddler is the only one to get two appearances this season, making him either the best of the rest, or the overarching boss of the season. Yin is the main character of focus for season two, besides the titular Batman, but the only new villain that appears as an antagonistic force in episodes where she appears is, you guessed it, Riddler. Otherwise, it's the bad guys from season one. Riddler is presented as the ultimate test of their partnership. Not Joker, not Penguin, not Catwoman, not Mr. Freeze, it's Riddler. Though, the Riddler doesn't appear in the first episode. It's dedicated to Penguin and Catwoman and Batman as they each decide who is the third wheel. Because, you know, Penguin gets to work a little bit close yes. to Poison Ivy. Yeah. So I think anytime, uh, you know, Oswald Cobblepot uh, can get anywhere near a woman, he's thrilled. Uh, so it's a good day for him anytime he's near a lady. Uh, he's, he's a lonely guy, you know. He's, he used to be this rich, uh, this rich, uh, you know, guy whose family was, uh, you know, the Kennedys of Gotham, and then uh, then he lost it all. So he's a bitter cat, you know, or a bitter penguin. Where Yin is skeptical of Batman, but she decides she has to trust him because they're a bigger fish to fry. Batman fully earns Yin's trust in the episode, signified when she lets him keep half of a very dangerous Egyptian relic, cementing their partnership. It leads into the next episode where they face their first real test together, Riddler. Ah, oh, you made it, Detective. Pity about your hard drive over here. But the bridge is set to blow, and only you can prevent it. In Riddle, the question marked foe sets up bombs across the city and tests Yin and Batman by giving them riddles. Gotham Bridge. Two year old could have figured that one out. This entire thing seems like a game, but there's actually a reason for it. Riddler is using it as a distraction so that he can hack into the city's mainframe and steal all the data. Knowledge is power. Pity about your hard drive over here. You're ice cold. You couldn't be further from the truth, detective. Oh, now you're boring me. Boring. Like a drill. Riddler can't resist leaving riddles, even once he shouldn't be. Batman figures out that even though it's a charade, Riddler can't help but leave clues for Batman to figure out what's really going on. Riddler comes off as a games man, but he's in it for the thrill of the chase. It's explicitly stated in his last major appearance that it's such, but here it's only mostly spelled out for you. But aren't you the smart detective to see the riddles within my riddles? It turns out that the information was not the real reward that he was seeking, only a mere consolation prize. What Riddler really wants to know is what everyone in Gotham wants to know. Who is the Batman? Would that be your IQ or the Batman's? I don't know what you're talking about. Please! Do you think I went to all the trouble to distract Gotham PD from my real crime? It was the Batman who concerned me. Though he fails in both measures, not merely because of the Batman, but Detective Yen as well. It's presented here that Riddler would have won if Yen were not involved. Teamwork and trusting others are major themes in the series, and they become incredibly apparent in Season 2. They were there in Season 1 with Alfred being a surrogate father of Bruce Wayne, and Bruce was almost ready to tell Ethan about him being the Batman, except, you know, the Joker got in the way. When Joker's through clowning with you, you won't know where to find your mind! <laughs> And Yin's partnership with Batman ultimately leads the way to him allying with Commissioner Gordon, Batgirl rather reluctantly, Robin out of a similar tragedy, and the Justice League. Batman is usually the Byronic hero brooding alone over the death of his parents. But this show has a Batman that eventually becomes a team player for the Justice League, 
It's surprisingly Superman that's the holdout in another classic inversion of the regular expectation. It's situations like these where Batman's wits and bronze are put to the test that lead him to reveal that maybe teamwork isn't the worst thing after all. Riddler attempts to get a Pyrrhic victory over Batman and Yin by exposing the detective to Chief Rojas, who is not at all a fan of the Batman. Since Batman works from the shadows, Rojas never saw him at all that night. And more importantly, Riddler's riddles drove Rojas up a wall the entire episode. He didn't believe the green spandex crazy man. Swim nor ugh, I hate riddles, and I don't play games with madmen. Follow her. Riddler gets locked away in Arkham, but by the season finale, he somehow is able to break out of the asylum like how all the super criminals do. At night in the city, Riddler is ready to start a new game. This time challenging fellow A-list rogues Joker and Penguin to see which supervillain can unmask the Batman first. Riddler is presented as being above Joker and Penguin in this episode, and it may not matter in terms of popularity, but it does matter in terms of threat level, at least in this episode. Riddler is one step ahead of Joker, Penguin, the police, and even Batman, until about 10 minutes in. Then Batman starts to gain the upper hand by the old switcheroo. But still, Riddler upstages Joker and Penguin here, and it's an impressive feat, considering that Joker and Penguin have already appeared 7 and 4 times in the series, while Riddler has only appeared once. With the game that the three villains compete to unmask the Bat, Chief Rojas beats them all to the punch first, discovering that Yin is working with the Bat. Maybe he finally put two and two together eventually from Riddler informing him back at the beginning of the season, or maybe he grew suspicious of her not being as aggressive in her pursuit of the Batman as she was in season one. He says that it was because she was always sneaking off, but you know, Riddler comes back and maybe it stirs up the doubt. Hello, Gotham PD. I am the Riddler, and Detective Yin here has just proven herself qualified to play. The episode is about thinking outside the box, as newly appointed Commissioner Gordon puts it, and Riddler takes that approach. Perhaps thinking outside the box might include going public with his support of the Batman? He's not going to hunt down the Batman like Joker and Penguin try to do. Instead, he leads the Batman to him. Well, okay, he does try to trap Batman to expedite the game, but that's always something that's been rather confusing to me. In the scene, Batman throws smoke pellets so Joker and Penguin were coughing up a lung when they accidentally got caught in the trap. Without the smoke, they were in fighting shape. The way the episode shows it would lead us to believe that Riddler would have no chance against the Batman as Joker and Penguin easily handle Riddler's goons. Maybe the plan was to stun Batman and Yin immediately instead of stealing Penguin's umbrella and waiting for Riddler to decide what to do. Otherwise, it's a pretty far-fetched end to his plan. Unless he had gas in the device, but he didn't activate it because Batman's smoke grenade did the trick. I don't know. The episode really needed an extra 5-8 to eight minutes that it didn't have to wrap the plot of the season up. And it did its best with the little time it had, but it's still pretty unsatisfying. This episode was monumental enough that it could have been a two-parter, especially since this is the only season of the show that didn't have one. Plan. Keep a lookout. I thought I was your partner. But you're not my sidekick. And this is basically the way they wrap up the season arc in one line that's heavy on the foreshadowing. Yin disobeys Batman's orders to stay put, and once again, she helps him defeat Riddler before he can crush him with a crane of all things. Yeah, usually the crane doesn't work, but I mean, Batman did it once later and it does work because, you know, he's Batman. Once again, Riddler underestimates Detective Yin and it leads to his downfall. Yin's given a rather unceremonious ending to her story in favor of Batgirl and Commissioner Gordon being Batman's sidekick and partner next season, and it's never addressed why this change was made, especially in the haphazard way it's done. Like I said, this episode should have been extended into a two-parter. It's a significant turning point in the series, and you end up getting the feeling that it's compressed when you start watching the third season and suddenly Yin is gone without any explanation. With Yin gone, Riddler doesn't appear in Season 3 at all. Even though Dwayne Capizzi was still in charge of writing the show, it's clear that the Batman was going in a different direction. Yin and Ethan Bennett slash Clayface are nowhere to be seen, and the focus shifts to Batgirl and Commissioner Gordon. Detective Yin informs me the pager you supplied to her is on the blink. Season 2 ends with Gordon telling Batman that it's time for Batman and the police to work together. 
Batman wins the game by defeating Joker, Penguin, Riddler, and evading Chief Rojas that he's earned Gotham's trust. The audience starts to see this at the end of Fire and Ice when the police cheer Batman instead of attempting to arrest him. Uh, get him! The Batman, he saved us. Yeah, he saved the city. So season 3 is especially a new frontier in the series. The headliner is not Commissioner Gordon, but his daughter Barbara, who becomes Batgirl. Batgirl takes over for Yin as the secondary character focus for the season, and since Yin is Riddler's villain, there wasn't more Riddler in the cards. And it wasn't because of the question who is the Batman was growing stale. The question was, why have Riddler when you can have THE Riddler? Along with Riddler, there was another character introduced in Season 2 that would have long-lasting implications for the series. Arguably being the second most important villain to the show besides Joker. This character is Hugo Strange. Professor Strange, right? Hugo Strange. Call me Bruce. Oh, congratulations by the way. Chief of Psychiatry at Arkham. Ah, oh, my promotion, yes, yes, yes. Thank you, thank you. In the second season, it's not revealed that Hugo is a villain. Why? Well, because this was the days before the Batman Arkham City game, so Hugo wasn't a mainstream Batman villain. He had one appearance in B-Taz and then a cameo in Justice League, which would have led into another appearance but the Bat embargo got in the way because the Batman showrunners decided to use Strange in the Batman. To the children watching the Batman, they were very unlikely to know that Strange was a villain. I certainly didn't. You could tell that something was up with Strange though. You just couldn't put your finger on it, you just didn't know that he was going to be a supervillain. This is all very ironic considering that Hugo Strange is one of Batman's first villains, but he doesn't have a colorful costume so he's just a regular mad scientist, not someone that's going to star in a Batman movie. So who did the Batman get to voice the mad scientist? Well none other than the definitive Riddler, Frank Gorshin. It's another incredible Batman performance by Gorshin as Hugo Strange took up the mantle of attempting to figure out who was the Batman and what makes him tick in Season 3. Unfortunately Gorshin couldn't finish the performance, we never got to hear him ham it up in the role as he succumbed to lung cancer at the age of 72, only appearing in 3 episodes. Right before Strange's heel turn as a villain was revealed. Yeah, he was a heavy smoker throughout his life. Though Gorshin's untimely death didn't appear to impact the direction of the series as Hugo Strange retained his prominence throughout the series as the recurring villain. What's odd about Season 3 is that they bring in a couple of new villains like Gearhead who was a character introduced in the comics in the 1990s, but he was given a child friendly design. He was also voiced by Terry McGinnis. And Toymaker who was an XB of the Superman villain Toyman, but they both didn't land. You'd think that these villains would be for Batgirl, but in the episode with Toymaker, she doesn't even appear. Batgirl's arc ends with Thunder, which is the 11th episode production-wise, but the 10th episode aired, where she earns her stripes as Batgirl. The ultimate episode of the season is not about Batgirl, but Hugo Strange as he designs a super criminal to defeat the Batman. So season 3 was rather strange. Capizzi and co decided to include Batgirl because they were prevented from using Robin because he was still in Teen Titans. But that was short lived as Teen Titans ended in January 2006 so the Batman was allowed to use Robin in Season 4, which pushed Batgirl and Commissioner Gordon out of focus. Season 4 was designed to be a fan service season for the fans as Season 5 would be Batman and the Justice League, so they wanted to go all out for this one. Seasons 1-3 through three were very Joker and Penguin heavy so their appearances and focus were trimmed down. Arguably Joker didn't even have a spotlight episode this season. This season's storyline functionally ends with episode 11 Rumors, as the next episode marks the appearance of Martian Manhunter and the opening up of Batman's world. Part of season 4 was dedicated to wrapping up some of the loose ends of the past few seasons, such as Ethan Bennett's ultimate fate, having a couple of big villain team ups, and most importantly for our purposes today, an ending to Riddler's story. Okay, try this one on for size. What's at the beginning that's also at the end? The answer is Gorman. And you, Batman, at the beginning and now the end of my career as the Riddler. In an interview with the world's finest before the launch of the fourth season, new executive producer and BTAS alumni Alan Burnett had this to say about the new batch of episodes. This season gets into more psychology with the characters. 
Stan Berkowitz wrote an Origin of the Riddler, for example, to show you what makes him tick. Psychology tends to make things darker, but I can't say that much darker on the show. Batman's always had a sense of humor, and Batman is older than he was in the beginning, so he has matured. He has a team now, if that's what you want to call two hyperactive teenagers, and he's definitely in command. Giving Riddler a backstory is a big deal because no other villain has their origin story told in a flashback and has that flashback take up a significant chunk of the episode. Riddler's final appearance is another mystery, it's just that he's not the one posing the questions this time. The first two appearances had Riddler wanting to know, who is the Batman? Are you single? Are you a celebrity? Are you wealthy? Are you wise? This time, it's who set up Edward Nigma. The whole idea of telling an origin story of one of the villains is not what was originally intended with the series. Dwayne Capizzi said so in an interview with The World's Finest between the airings of season 2 and 3. The intention was certainly to give this series a different look from Vitaz and to keep the action quotient high. From a storytelling standpoint, we wanted to tell the stories less from the villain's point of view and more from Bruce Wayne's. Because we wanted our sympathies to be with Bruce, to experience his various dilemmas as he grows to become a better Batman, we made the decision to avoid pathos with the bad guys. At least on a regular basis. There are notable exceptions, of course. Yen, what's become of us? Season 4 branched out the Batman in a way that the other seasons had not, and as a result, the stories told in this season feel more distinct from the past three. Riddler's Revenge is another example of the show's evolution, as it tells the beginning and ending of the Riddler character in a way that the Batman had not done, and would not do, again, in the rest of the series. After taking a season hiatus, Riddler is back, but his target is not the Batman. Instead, his target is a businessman named Gorman, whom Riddler believes sabotaged one of his inventions to get him out of the picture so he could profit off of it. Riddler captures Gorman and prepares to execute his revenge on the man he believes to have ruined him. Then Batman comes and calls him a joke. A joke, Riddler. That's the answer. It's also what you are. Riddler clearly is upset that the Batman is there. This was personal, Batman. Indicating that this time Riddler did not give him a hint that he was there. The Cape Crusader happened to pop in to foil Enigma again. This time Riddler got an upgrade with goons in the muscle department. After Penguin, Joker, Yin, and Batman had no trouble with his former goons, it makes sense that he upgraded. Although Riddle established that Riddler has some fighting chops, which he and Penguin don't traditionally have as this is an action show, he's still outclassed by the Batman, especially when he doesn't have Riddles to hide behind. The show has power creep, and it affects every villain not named Joker. Riddler clearly suffers from this here as Batman has dealt with much bigger physical and supernatural threats in Season 3 and 4, like Poison Ivy and the new Clayface. Without his riddles, Riddler is completely vulnerable to a more experienced Batman than the one he faced in Season 2. And most importantly, Riddler does not have the element of surprise. Had Gorman not blown up his own ship to get rid of Riddler, it would have been game over for the green spandex villain before the game even begun. Even though the writers brought Riddler back, he's still a relic from the past. He's fallen from a legitimate threat to a complete joke, so much so that his own bombs are used to destroy him instead of their intended target, leaving Batman and Riddler stuck at the bottom of Gotham Bay. What is 9,857? We're trapped. It's how many seconds before we run out of air? Presumably doomed, Riddler decides to tell Batman the story of how they first met, filling in the blanks of what Batman did not know. And no, I'm not talking about Riddled. I'm talking about an entirely new first encounter that we never saw before. Riddler's backstory shows us that Riddler became a villain out of choice, his desire for revenge. This origin story isn't sympathetic whatsoever. This isn't Baby Doll or Mad Love from B-Taz. It's a story of how Riddler chose to be the Riddler. Of course, from Riddler's perspective, he states that he didn't have much of a choice in the matter, which outside from his obsessive compulsiveness, it doesn't have much legs to stand on. Riddler is shown to have a past of being a con artist before he came to Gotham University. Though his inventions were not made to help people, that was only a benevolent byproduct. They were made to inflate his ego, to win the game, to confront and beat challenges that nobody else could. And the game moves to a swift finish. Riddler's favor. The goal with the Riddler is always to win, everything else is secondary. 
when he is humiliated and fired from the university for his device malfunctioning, he suspected Gorman tampered with it. I was ruined. And in that one moment, I lost my last chance to... To what? To not be the Riddler. So like any sane person, Nigma resorts to booby trapping Gorman's house. The sequence is clearly heavily inspired by the Saw franchise, which debuted in 2004. Rick, is, is this a Saw thing? Are you seriously sawing the Vindicators? Morty, I'm a drunk, not a hack. If you break the rules, lose the game, or try to leave, you will die. Like in uh, Saw. The Arkham games did this with Riddler 2, particularly in Arkham City. The Saw craze arguably influenced Batman media on a scale beyond just the Riddler, as a lot of the most notable new villains created in Batman in that era are disgusting horror rogues compared to the colorful criminals of the past. With the Batman, the show had to temper Riddler's traps, so you get this cool sequence that isn't gruesome and horror horrific like the Saw films. Which got more and more grotesque as it tried to make it more shocking year after year. So this encounter between Edward Nigma and the Batman is such an obvious retcon that it sticks out like a sore thumb. It's not a major retcon like the inclusion of Lucius Fox to coincide with the Dark Knight trilogy, but anyone watching this above the target age demographic would know that this is a plot hole. There's no way that someone like the Batman would forget the night he walked into a house which is rigged with traps, or as Nigma puts it, interior decorating. There's always the question of where this occurred. It certainly happened before Riddled, but did it occur around the time of season one or before that? Before the Batman first encountered Joker, Penguin, Catwoman, and the like. If it happened before, it would be more likely for Batman to remember because of how strange it was, but if it happened during Season 1, you could also argue that he would remember it because of how recent it was. There aren't any explicit time skips except the one year gap between Seasons 4 and 5, so if it happened around Season 1, then it wasn't a significant amount of time. You could hand wave this all by saying that Batman knew who Riddler was all along and remembered that night, but he never told Yin because it was irrelevant, but we hear the Batman think in that episode and it's not about whom Riddler is but about what Riddler does. Yes, this is a retcon, but it's not a huge deal. Often retcons are done to make the story better, or in the case of Akira Toriyama, he forgot what happened a year ago. And this story needed that retcon in order to function. As I alluded to before, Riddler's whole story is a riddle. It's the question of the episode. Who set Riddler up? Riddler concludes that it's Gorman because Gorman wanted his hands on Enigma's technology, but he wasn't willing to sell out to the businessman. Riddler doesn't understand that Gorman is the red herring because he's blinded by his own personal experiences and emotions. Gorman was the type of person that Nigma hated and it made it easier, if not completely obvious to him, that Gorman somehow found a way to get him out of the picture. Batman reminds him that riddles aren't as simple as they always appear at first glance and Nigma realizes that he was wrong. You sure it was Gorman who sabotaged you? Even you, Batman, could have puzzled together a mystery this obvious. <laughs> yeah. Obvious. I guess I just figured with a riddle, the most obvious answer is rarely the right one. Once again, Batman beats Riddler at his own game, at his own life even, as a detective deduces what the great genius Riddler could not. Who set Enigma up? So tell me, Batman, how'd you piece together? It was my Julie who betrayed me. How? Easy. Gorman was a businessman, not a scientist. He would never have known how to sabotage that disc, and that just left one other person. <laughs> Anyone would have realized that, except you, champ. Batman and Riddler work together to get out of their predicament, and Riddler shows once again that he's inferior to Batman when he gets the upper hand out of sheer good luck. His men found them first, and he decides to eliminate the competition disgracefully because he knows that the Batman will get in the way of his revenge. One could call this cheating, but there is a precedent for this before as he tries to get rid of Joker and Penguin in Night in the City. Boys, eliminate the competition. You're a lousy host. And you two are lousy competition. Likewise, the character is a history of being a sore loser. Here Riddler already knows that Batman solved the riddle before him, so he figures that it's best to... No more question marks, Batman. Now we put a period at the end of your life. Another way to look at this is that it gives Robin a role in the story. He is the one that comes to save Batman. Of course, it could have been Batgirl or Commissioner Gordon as well, but this is Robin's season, so it's going to be him. This story could have been told without Robin, and they could have chose Alfred, for instance, to find Batman. 
But that would have led to Stan Berkowitz changing the script, having Riddler be a gracious loser and give Batman a chance to try and stop him. But Riddler has already been foiled twice when Batman's uncovered his riddles, so Riddler clearly knows that by now he's no match for the Batman. What are you doing? Oh, I know, I know. He's about to get his butt kicked. Am I right? And now let's get to Robin. I'd argue that this is the episode of season 4 where he has the least amount of prominence. This is Robin's season, and as the sidekick of Batman, he's going to get a lot more focus than Ethan Bennett, Ellen Yin, Batgirl, or the Justice League got in their respective seasons. Robin is the light in Batman's brooding dark. He's a way to make the Batman not so gritty to younger audiences. Once Robin was allowed on the show, Michael Jelinek, the head writer of season 4, wasted no time in making the show Batman and Robin. There weren't episodes where Robin didn't appear, except for one later episode in season 5, Robin was a mainstay and completely overshadowed Batgirl, Commissioner Gordon, and Alfred. So here's the problem, what do you do with Robin in the story? Well, they decide to keep him on the sidelines in a B-plot, where he tries to get out of school to save Batman, but his teacher knows that he's the boy that keeps crying wolf and won't let him out so easily. It's a way to lighten this episode, but it also builds suspense. It doesn't make sense the deeper you look into it. Why is Robin, a middle school kid, the one solely responsible for saving Batman when there's Batgirl and Alfred who have access to Batwave and Commissioner Gordon? Of course, Riddler's revenge doesn't mention any of them because it would poke holes into the story. So Robin saves Batman and the two chase down Riddler, who attempts to enact his revenge on Julie, his former lab partner whom he was attracted to. There's a riddle I'm having trouble solving. You were always so good at them. Maybe you can help. The $64,000 question? Why did I sabotage our project? Come on, Edward. It's not that hard. <sighs> I thought you understood me. I understood you were a psychopath. One that was going to ruin any chance for success. And so you got rid of me. Very smart. But I think we can make you smarter yet. Yeah, it's a little too dark a subject to have Robin be entirely involved. It wouldn't have been a good idea for Robin to be in the bottom of Gotham Bay either. As Jeff Matsuda puts it, How we decide to add new villains or just use the, ro the rogues gallery, what percentage it is, is mainly based on the stories we want to tell. If we have a bunch of new stories that don't exist with any villains that make any sense, we'll make up a new one. But if there's a story about how, how we want to test Batman's mind, we'll probably use the Riddler. So this was a puzzle for Batman to figure out. Since Robin wasn't in the first two Riddler episodes, there wasn't a reason to include him fully in the show. As Riddler's revenge was about the past, something that Robin had no part in, he didn't need to have a full role. Riddler's inability to finish the Batman off leads to his demise once again as the Bat takes down Nygma for the third time. Although during this bout, Batman seems to have some sympathy for the rogue. One last riddle, Robin. When is a villain not the villain? The way the ending plays out leads one to suspect that they were going for the pathos with Riddler, which is something that the only Batman villain to get in this series was Clayface. I don't remember my reaction to this ending as a child, I would guess that I felt sad for him, but looking at Riddler's revenge today, I definitely don't feel sympathetic toward him. It was established in his flashback that he wasn't above conning people to push his intellect. He was someone that puts his wants over others. His abusive father played into that, but Riddler had the opportunity to rise above his past and he chose to be a criminal. One could argue that he might have been blacklisted from the scientific community because of the incident, but it's not explicitly stated. A lot of season 4 has to do with choice. Batman chooses to take Dick Grayson on as Robin. Batman chooses to let Batgirl know his secret identity. Ethan Bennett decides to be cured of his affliction instead of remaining Clayface. Batman decides whether or not to play Hugo Strange's game. Like, the whole episode before Riddler's Revenge was about the unstoppable Time Lord villain, Francis Gray, making a choice whether he wanted to proceed with his plan. Choice versus destiny is a very common superhero theme because it's meant to empower the viewer to make beneficial choices, and to build their self-esteem so that they can get through times that are difficult. The villains are often framed as characters that consider their situation to be faded, they didn't have a chance to be anything different. Riddler is a bit more complicated than that. And in that one moment, I... Lost my last chance to do not be the Riddler. But by now, he's reached the point of no return. A normal civilian life is out of the cards. He chose to be the Riddler. Deciding to be a criminal results in his failure. He chose a life of revenge while Batman chose a life of vengeance. Even with all that intellect in his head, Riddler still can't triumph over the Batman. 
His ending is pathetic, consumed by his own negative emotions, and even Batman takes pity upon him. He's a joke. He could have used his intellect to help people, but he put his own selfish games above everything else, leading to a road of failure. Riddler is a mystery, but his last feature appearance solves the puzzle that is his character. Everything that we want to know about Riddler we learn, probably more than we ever wanted to know. Riddler desires acknowledgement for his great intellect, especially from the Batman. But we come to the conclusion that this is a man, while brilliant, is one consumed with his own obsessions. One thing you can argue with the Riddler is whether him leaving riddles is guilt for his crimes, but with this iteration of the character, that's clearly not the case. He has, what's the psychological term? Most Batman villains have, I guess, borderline personality disorder if they were diagnosed in real life, and with him, it's obviously obsessive compulsive disorder, but I'm clearly not a psychiatrist, so take that diagnosis that I found on Google with a truckload of salt. Riddler's a joke in the lighthearted sense. A tragedy from a psychological puzzle solved. You and me work together. I'm into riddles, not jokes. Riddler gets a definitive ending. Him locked up in Arkham forever, thoroughly defeated. But we get a detour in one last final appearance in Season 4's Rumors, which is the end of the non-Justice League part of the series. Riddler and all the other villains are captured by a rogue vigilante, and they are all freed in the fight between Batman and Rumor, which leads to an epic fight scene between the dynamic duel and the villains. Like most of the other rogues, Riddler only has a small part, but it's a better part than being frozen by Mr. Freeze. This is the end for the Batman as we know it, and a huge swath of his rogues gallery, including Catwoman, Riddler, and the Kabuki twins, either don't appear again or don't have a major appearance in Season 5. Riddler is among the former as this is his last hurrah. It's a rather ignominious end to the character's arc on the show, being taken down like a footnote, but at least his character arc was finished with Riddler's revenge. It's more than one can say about Catwoman. Still, it's better than what happened with the Riddler in the new Batman adventures. Gotham's infamous vigilante working hand in hand with a cop? Scandalous. This Riddler's appearance is an enigma. It's so striking in its contrast to a typical Riddler design. With the long hair, pale skin, and Nike appearance, he looks a lot like how Marilyn Manson looked back in the early 2000s. Listen, your parents tell me you've been acting out a little bit, and I just want to tell you, rock and roll music is cool, but respect for your elders is a tune we can all dance to. The reason the character looks so different than the suit and tie version of B-Taz in the Batman Forever inspired spandex suit of the new Batman Adventures can be summed up by the series story editor Dwayne Capizzi. In the case of the classic rogues, we stayed true to their conceptions while giving them makeovers. In the case of more obscure villains, we took more leeway in reimagining them. The decision was made to keep the villains out of suits and ties and keep them in colorful costumes and personalities. For those of you who don't know, Marilyn Manson is a musician whom straight-laced Americans blame for any and all tragedies, especially one that occurred in Colorado in 1999. What in the world was that for? Oh, it's a gag. That's for ruining our son. He used to be a sweet boy until he heard your music. <laughs> oh, this old story. If I had a nickel. The connection with this Riddler character isn't much to speak aside from the gothic design. But you could take Riddler getting the blame for his invention going haywire as an allegory for people blaming Manson's music for everything under the sun when it obviously isn't the case. There isn't a huge difference between this Riddler and the various Riddlers in other media. This Riddler definitely is a quieter take on the character. He's not going to jump off the walls like Jim Carrey or Frank Borshin's interpretations. A lot of this has to do with Riddler's voice actor, Robert Ungland, who is the actor Freddy Krueger. Yeah, that guy. The Batman was a kid's Saturday morning cartoon, so they couldn't go the horror route with this character. But what's interesting is that Englund voices the Scarecrow in Injustice 2, a fighting game. Just listen to this. After studying Brainiac's blood, I tweaked my fear toxin to exploit his alien biology. And as I gained control of his shattered mind, I also gained control of his ship. I began to explore Brainiac's enormous collection, soon realizing it was an unprecedented opportunity for study. Billions of species from millions of worlds, each with its own phobias and fears. Now, the Skull Ship is my laboratory. As it glides through the vast darkness of space, its collected beings are subjected to their worst nightmares. Yeah, England's performance as a Scarecrow sounds very similar to the one he gave for this Riddler. 
The unkempt, lanky appearance of Edward Nigma in the Batman gives one a very uneasy feeling. He could easily fit into a horror movie. He may not have the slasher physique, but he does have somewhat competent fighting ability in this cartoon. Above all else, this Riddler stands out for his appearance and not for his personality. Despite being a proverbial A-list Batman villain, the Riddler often gets the short end of the stick in animation. A cerebral Riddler doesn't have as much allure in a kid's cartoon show as the villain that has more comedic opportunities like the versions of Joker and Penguin. Still, three main appearances in a 65 episode show is nothing to scoff at, but it does place him in the middle of the pack in terms of villain occurrences. This depiction of the character isn't a bad take, even if the design is striking. Riddler may have not gotten prominence in favor of other villains like Joker and Hugo Strange, but he arguably has a bigger role in the Batman than he does in B-Taz. This incarnation of Riddler is most controversial for his appearance, but when you boil it all down, he's very consistent with the more mellow versions of the character. But that speaks more about the show than the specific villain. It is actually a good take on the Riddler character. That's all I got for today. Let us know what you think about Riddler and the Batman in the comments down below, and I'll see you next time. This is Titanius turning off the TV. Thanks for watching. Hey there, Titanius here. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe as it really helps the channel out. See you all next time. Bye.